21. Aloha, good morning. This is Pastor Is from Kona, Hawaii here at Amazing Grace Ministries. And I get the privilege today of sharing with you Psalm 121. And it's a psalm of great comfort to our hearts. I just got to give the pre-announcements uh, about 40 minutes ago. I got to see John Gravett was online, my dear brother that used to live with us over here. And uh, it's so cool to see him. I hope that he joins us back on live here. If not, if you want, you can listen to this anytime afterwards. It gets posted and stays available. So if you hear this word and it encourage you, or you're listening and you say, you know what? I have a friend who really needs to hear that. That's... um. That's right up the, the, through the trials they're going through. They could really use this. Do me a favor. Share it uh, through the social media. You guys know. Just hit the share button below. And you can put to a friend's timeline. Share it over their timeline. Or you can share it onto your wall. And uh, it really helps get the word out. So I can do the best preaching. But I can't. Um, I'm not the social media master. So if you can help me out with that. I really appreciate that. So today we're in Psalm 121. And we've been looking at, we looked at two psalms over the last two weeks. And um, last week's psalm was actually from book five. The last, uh, some people don't know the psalms is grouped in Hebrew into five books. Hey, Rusty, good to see you. And uh, into five books. And we're in the fifth book right now, the last grouping of the psalms. And it's grouped in the first part from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 is the grouping of called the Psalms of Ascent. And uh, I talked about this here for us that we're doing worship. The ascent means uh, ascending up to Jerusalem. Whenever the Israelites were commanded to come together, which was an annual thing they had to do at Passover, remember, and Feast of Booths, they had these annual feasts that they had to come together to worship the Lord at His sanctuary there in Jerusalem. And so whenever they would uh, be going to Jerusalem, now don't think in American uh, way of speech because whenever you say let us go up to somewhere and you're here in America they think that you're down south and you're heading north that means we're going up to that place in Israel if you say let us go up to the house of the Lord let us go up to Jerusalem to the holy city it didn't matter if you're coming from the north the south the east or the west it was not it was not uh, referring to a point on the compass when it said let us go up it was referring to a spiritual attitude the highest place we can go up to meet with God is Jerusalem. We can go to his holy temple and meet with him as he's prescribed. You know, if we, he said if we would just come and humble ourselves there, that he would, he, and it, he would accept our, and hear our prayers and he would answer. And so as the Israelites were go going up to Jerusalem, in the so book five of the Psalms, the first 120 to 134, those first 14 psalms, 15 psalms, are all songs they would sing as they were heading up to Jerusalem. So we sang them this morning. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together. And, and as the mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is around his people. And so we sang the psalms rejoicing in that idea. The Lord is always around us and he's watching over us. And the first song we sang here at our fellowship this morning was from the psalms, this, this book of Song of Ascents. And it was Psalm 121, and it reads like this. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, or to the mountains, from, from whence shall my help come. My help comes from where? From the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And he will not allow your foot to slip. He, he who keeps you, it says, will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil and he will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going in and your cut. It says you're, I'm sorry, going out and you're coming in from this time forth. And how long? Forever. Forevermore. The Lord is going to watch over you for how long? Forever. Forever. Now, if I could pick a psalm to comfort some people, especially in these days when they seem to be stressing out a lot, like, oh no, we're in trouble. And it's almost like God quit his job. They call me up, pastor, pastor, I'm freaking out, you know. And I'm like, why, why, did God quit? And they're like, no, God didn't quit. I'm like, well, then why are you freaking out? Because it's really funny how quickly we forget that the Lord is watching over us. It, I mean, it's just a strange phenomenon. Whenever things go wrong, whenever we have troubles, 
all of a sudden it's like the, the people freak out and they're like, oh no, God has quit doing his job. He's abandoned me. And they'll call me up to complain, you know. This is all going wrong. This is terrible. And I, and I go, uh, 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 newsflash, did, did God quit? I didn't know he quit. And they'll, they're like, no, no, he didn't quit. And I'm like, oh, whew, good. I, I mean, I would, I would join you and run around like a chicken with my head cut off if he, if he quit his job. But last time I checked, he's on duty for how long? Forever. Forever. And he's never going to quit his job of watching over us. And that, as silly and simple as that sounds, is something that during a trial, it really boils down to the, the real litmus test of our faith. Is do you believe God is still on the throne when you're going through trouble? You know, when things aren't going your way, do you feel like, oh, yeah, he's still God. He's still in charge. He's still got this under control. I mean, we, we don't like when bad things happen to us. I'm sure Joseph didn't like it when his brothers picked on him. He was favored by his father, the favorite little boy. You know, ba daddy's little boy, baby. And I remember, this is before Benjamin was born. So he was the 11th child. And he was the one that dad got a multicolored tunic, remember? And, and, and woven for him and put it over him and he's got this special garment dad he got me this you know and you know how little kids are mm -hmm. you know like it, especially siblings little rivalry here daddy got me this my special tunic got all these colors and his brothers hated him they plotted they took they took him let's take him on a little uh, journey up to you know shepherd um, some sheep way way far away from dad let's get him a uh, out of dad's earshot and then what were they gonna do well the oldest the not the oldest but the the next the oldest they wanted to kill him now the oldest prevailed and said no no we can't do this let's throw him in this pit you know for the night and that'll scare him and he was thinking you know let's just shake him up a little and and uh, and, and he was gonna rescue him but his other brother's like no way man we're getting if we don't kill him they saw a caravan passing by going to Egypt and you know what they did they sold their little brother into slavery this is how much they liked their little brother. They sold him into slavery, and he wound up going off to, to Potiphar's house down in Egypt where he was a slave. And Potiphar found this young man, Joseph, to be so loyal, so good at taking care of everything in his house. So he put everything in his charge. He said he didn't worry about anything except what he was going to have for supper. Potiphar's like, man, this kid, he, he, he manages all my affairs, all my stuff, everything so great. The best servant I've ever had. And Potiphar goes on a journey, and while he's gone, what does his wife decide to do? Seduce. She decides to seduce. try to seduce Joseph. And so she calls him into her bedroom, come on in here, and, 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 and she grabs him by the garment and pulls off. He, he actually lets his outer garment off. You know, I could just see him, take, you know, strip and get away from me, lady. And um, she's pulling down his garment, and he flees out without his garment. She takes his garment and lays it next to her on the bed. And then cries out, help me, help me, he was trying to rape me, you know. Look, here's his garment. And, you know, like, like, uh, set him up. And as soon as Potiphar comes home, of course, they, he, he, he's so angry. You, you, you know, I gave you everything. I let you be in charge of everything in my house. And you went and you tried to sleep with my wife and he threw him into prison. And I'm sure Joseph just loving life this day. He goes from being, you know, already hated by his brothers, proves himself in the house of Potiphar, and then is thrown into jail, and there he stays in jail. Does anyone know how long he spends in jail? Long time. Long time. Thirteen years. Before he's there, and he's he's a young man now in his thirties, mm -hmm. and he he's um well, there's a a, a chief baker and a chief um. Wine taster. Wine, uh, wine taster. You know, the, the, it's kind of a bummer job if you're the wine taster for the mm -hmm. king because people are always trying to poison the king. <laughs> so before the king could get his cup, the wine taster had to take it and taste it and hold it and wait. And if he dropped dead, then the <laughs> king knew didn't, don't drink yeah. that wine. You know, someone slipped some poison in it. But if he stayed alive and it was looking good, then he passed the cup to the king. That was his, that was his duty. Well, they both kind of the chief baker and the chief cupbearer, they ticked off the king, so to speak, in modern-day English. And, and so the king threw them in jail. But Joseph, by this time, had become 
so well known in the jail that the jailer said, I don't have to do anything. I put Joseph in charge of everything, just like Potiphar had done. He has such a gift of administration. He keeps the jail running smooth. I don't have to do anything. And the chief cupbearer and the chief baker are in jail with him. And, and, and they both have dreams one night. And the chief baker says, I had a dream. It's really troubling me. And Joseph says, well, what's the dream? Do you guys remember the dream? He had a, he had a, a basket of loaves on his head. And, and, the, and the birds came and they picked at the bread and they ate it. And, and, uh, and then the chief cupbearer said, I had a dream too. And I, I, I dreamed I had some grapes. I rung them into the cup for the king and made the wine, you know, and gave it to the king. And the king was happy with the wine. And, and, the, and the, they were like, what do these dreams mean? And Joseph says, well, it's not. It's God who interprets dreams. It's God who gives the understanding. And so to the chief cupbearer, he says, well, your dream is that after three days, you're going to be restored to the presence of the king. And you, chief baker, you know, that thing with the birds pecking the bread off your head, and you in three days, your head, you're going to lose your head. You'll be dead. And so, do you guys remember what happened? Yeah. That comes to pass exactly as Joseph interpreted the dream. And the cupbearer is restored to the presence of the king. He's back doing his job. And Joseph says, hey, hey, when you go in front of the king, please remember me. You know, put in a word for me. You you're, you're got his ear. You're right next to him. You hand him his cup every day. Tell, tell him about me. Get me out of this place. I was wrongfully accused and put here. And even all the prisoners knew the story. They all knew that Potiphar's wife had, had you know, done this misjustice to Joseph. And Joseph, I'm sure, is going really loving these 13 years plus of life. Staying in jail, <coughs> running a jail with a bunch of prisoners in Egypt, sold out by his brothers. How much, how much damage do you think emotionally this kid had? You know, as a young man, sold out because my brothers hated me. Serve as a servant, then betrayed by the woman uh, of the master's what the master's wife, then suffering in this jail. And now the chief cupper, <laughs> he doesn't even remember Joseph for years. A few more years pass by, and the king has a dream, and it bugs the king. He's like, I had this dream, that there was these seven fat cows down by the river, and the seven sleek, bony, scrawny cows came up and ate the fat cows, and they didn't even look like they ate anything. They still looked scrawny. He's like, what does this mean? It troubled the king. Well... The cupbearer says, I don't want to bring this up, King. Remember a couple years ago when you are mad at me and you threw me in jail? And there was a guy in jail interpreted a dream that I had and, and, the, and the interpretation for me and the interpretation for the chief baker. Remember when you chopped off his head? Yeah, it came true exactly like this guy said. And the king goes, go get the guy. So they go and clean Joseph up. They bring him to the king, right? You guys know all this story, right? They bring him to the king and present Joseph to the king and, and, the, and the king tells him his dream. And Joseph says, it's not me that interprets dreams. Who is it that gives the understanding? The Lord. the Lord. He's always giving credit to the Lord. It's the Lord that gives the understanding. He said, and king, the Lord has revealed to you, you were pondering on your bed what will happen in the future. And the king, God showed you that there's going to be seven years of famine, but they're going to, fall, they're going to be preceded by seven years of fat, plenty. You're going to have plenty for seven years. Then you're going to have seven years of famine. That's going to eat up all the surplus from the seven years but plenty, so that it won't even seem like you had anything. And so God has shown you what's going to take place, and you should you should use some wisdom and use the seven years of plenty to get ready for the seven years of famine to come. You know, since God's warning you, get it all ready and and just get store up so you're ready to make it through the seven years of famine that are, that are going to be approaching uh, Egypt. And the king goes, "Where are we going to find a guy wise enough?" To do such an undertaking. And what's he, who's he pick? Joseph. Joseph. You're the guy that had the interpretation. You go figure it out. And so Joseph began to collect from the people every year a fifth of all of the earnings. And the whole of the land. All of the grain. All of the crops. And these these pyramids were built in Egypt. By, uh, by Joseph. And by the way, if you didn't ever study the first pyramids... They are simply desert grain silos. Nothing more. There's a shaft down the middle. There's a, only one door on the side. There's a big empty chasm in the inside. It's buried down into the earth a bit. And it keeps a constant temperature. 
And just like a grain silo, like back on the farms in the Midwest, where you dump the grain in the top, it stays in that big cavernous thing. It has a little chute at the bottom you open to get the grain out. These kind of work, but they needed to be more insulated. They need to be weatherproof for desert living. And so there in Egypt, they built them out of stone all the way up. You guys seen the pyramids and the, and it's so interesting to me when the guys say, oh, these pyramids were built for a, an edifice for the king. No, they weren't. You know, it's funny that the archaeologists, when they first opened them, were like, there was grain in all the corners. Mm. Perfectly preserved. And, and, you know, what was all this grain about? I'm like, mm. it says right in the Bible that Joseph had them prepared. They had seven years to get ready. Fast building project. Get them ready and store all this grain so that when... Joseph's brothers will later be down in Canaan's land and they'll be starving because the famine will reach all the way over to Israel and they'll say Jacob, Israel, his dad will say, we're going to starve boys I heard there's food in Egypt, go take these goods and go trade for it and get food and here come his brothers and they march right in front of who? Joseph, he's the one sitting by the base of the pyramid giving out the food and he recognizes his brothers that betrayed him he does a little fun with them, you know, puts his golden cup in one of their bags. And yeah, anyway, it's a lot of fun to read that story in Genesis. But, but uh, it all, it, during all this time, there's something that you got to understand. Who was watching over Joseph? The Lord. the Lord. And I don't think that he particularly liked the trials he was going through. You know, John, in John's Gospel, Jesus writes, In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He didn't say, in this world, you're never going to have any troubles. He said, you will. In fact, he guarantees you're going to have tribulations. Anyone can give an amen to this that you get tribulations? <laughs> tribulations happen. Trials and tribulations come our way, and it's just part of the character-building assignment God has for us. Don't stress. If you're going through a trial right now, just think, Okay, God must be working something. But it doesn't mean he's quit his job. So don't call me up to tell me. Because you just need to remember the Lord is watching over you. He's got you. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. That means he's never off the clock. That's the way I look at it when it says he never sleeps nor slumbers. He's always looking out for me. In fact, that's what helps me sleep at night. When sometimes, you know, there's so much going on in the brain and you can't, have you ever had it where you can't shut off your brain? You just, the wheels are grinding and you're laying there and you're tossing and you're turning. And I have to go, you know what, God, you're on the clock all the time. And I'm not, why are you said you're mindful of me that I am but dust? My dust can't stay awake 24 seven without pretty soon having a short out. There'll be something, if I stay up too long, too many nights in a row, Something's going to, I've tried it for finals week, you know, there's like sleep deprivation training. You go to college and then just cr you cram all night. You get up, you take a test, you're like a zombie. Then you cram for the next test and you're like a zombie. You do this for a couple, you know, a full, you know, two weeks or so at the end of the semester. And you're just like fall down and die when the thing's over. Because you, we, we're just not wired to go for no sleep. And I had to finally realize, you know, Lord. You said you give to those that are yours even in their sleep. In the Psalms, and by the way, in the book of Psalms, of the, the, the last book, book five, it says that if you follow the Lord, he will give. Maybe I'll do that song with you next week. He gives to you even when you're sleeping. So when you, some of you are stressing out saying, no, no, I got to stay up and work this out. I got to do this for God in the middle of the night. And he's going, just go to sleep. I got you. I can take care of you even in the night. And he watches over you day and night. And that's something that you just need to understand. He is there. He's going to shade you by his right hand. He is literally going, here, I got you covered. Don't worry. About it. Just, you need a little shade there. Let me put my hand over you. But the sun will not burn you by it. Let me just protect you and watch over you. And now, how many of you guys like the idea that God is watching over you? I know I do. I, I, I think sometimes we, we overcomplicate the gospel. I shared this last week. We make it way too hard for people to come to God. Instead of telling them, look, God's on the job all the time. He's looking out for you all the time. He loves you so much. And all you have to do is call on his name and he will hear your cry. He will answer you. If you call out to the Lord, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, the scripture guarantees, Romans says, you call on the name of the Lord and you shall be what? Saved. Saved. 
That's as simple as it gets. Don't over, just tell your friends. Man, if you get in trouble, call on the Lord. He's always on watch. And all you got to do is call out to him and he'll save you. It's that simple. It's so great. But us believers have been saved a while. We forget about that. Like, we get going and we, I don't know why. We think we got to help God. It's like all of a sudden he can't be God anymore. You know, but some people get this weird illusion, uh, d delusion that God is, I don't know, in need of their super strength or something. That's why he put me on his team, you know. I got picked to be on the God squad because he needed good guys like me to help get stuff done. <laughs> ha! I got news for you. He does stuff that you can't even figure out. And he might send you somewhere and it might seem like you're in jail. You might feel like Joseph in some seasons of life. But when the Lord opens up that thing that he's got for you, and all of a sudden you're sitting at the right hand of the king and you're running the country. Because the Bible tells us Pharaoh didn't worry about anything. Well, he kind of went to the same thing Potiphar did. I'll just get my food and that's all I got to worry about because Joseph's got the whole country running just fine. God can take you from humble beginnings and put you in, in a place you didn't even know was coming. But he does that by his power and his might, not by your ability. In fact, who do you think gave God, Joseph the ability to be such a gifted administrator? God. God made him with that gifting. I have a friend named Joseph Natali, and he is a gifted administrator. He, he really is, man. That guy, and he has administrated so many good works for the Lord. Helping kids in Roatan, setting up incentive for the kids. They love football down there. We call it soccer in America, but they, he lo they love football, and... and uh, he sets up soccer teams for the for the poor and underprivileged kids and tells them, I will buy you cleats, I will buy you a uniform, I will, I will get you on the team if you get good grades. Bring me, he knows that if he, because they're so impoverished and they're so um, behind the eight ball that, you know, that there's no emphasis on the education. And so he gives the kids a little incentive. He knows they love soccer. So kids, if you do well, I will pay for you to be on the soccer team. I will make sure you get a scholarship, but you got to bring me some good grades. And they bring him good grades, and he pays for them to get on it. And, and he sees what it does to the community as these little ones grow up learning and, and growing. And, and by the way, he's always into educating them about the Lord. Yeah. Not, just, not just the you know, mathematics and the, the reading, but to get them to learn the Lord. Now, he has a gift of administration beyond I, uh, many men I've ever met. But his gift is just like my, I'm a gifted teacher, as people tell me. But I can tell you I got my gift from God. And, and the Bible says whatever gift you have, you should exercise your gift. Some of you have gifts and you're not using them. And I'm here to tell you, don't sit on your gift. God gave it to you, use it. Practice it. Use it. My, I always use the analogy, I gave my son a bicycle. When he was young and and he rode he rode that sucker till the tires were bald i mean he literally rode we would see the little did you know there's fabric underneath the rubber and then under the fabric is like a little few strings and he burnt right through those all the way to the inner tubes we, we would be like not having to just replace the outer tire we had to replace the outer tire and the inner tube because he burned through the whole thing riding it so much and he'd be out there look dad and he'd be standing up on the seat Oh my gosh. With his finger on the handlebars, then he go, no hands, and put it back, no hands, you know. And he go going down coasting down the street on the you know, top bar, you know. Woo, woo, watch this. And then he'd be doing all these tricks. And his sister's like, I gotta have a bicycle, I gotta have a bicycle. And I was like, oh, when do you ever ride a bicycle? I got her a brand new bicycle. Sat on the side of the house, collected dust. She rode it like once, right? Twice. I think Joy rode her bike twice. Tires or stuff. I was like, forget this. When Daniel's tires were out, I'm picking those tires and putting them on her on his bike. And he's like, no, Dad, they're white. I don't want white tires. I want the black tires. You know? Ah, oh, girly bike, you know. Shoot. But the thing is, is that he used his gift so much that he could. He got to that place where it was just like, I got the I got the balance sweet point down. You know, that's not. I can ride no hands. I, I, you know, when you use your gift so much, that it just becomes natural. 
that you're comfortable doing it. When pe people say, when you teach, you just seem so comfortable. You're like, just this natural. Well, I've only been doing it for 40 years. I hope by now I got the balance point down. <laughs> you know, I hope that I figured, but it doesn't come from not using it. We're talking, you know, there's times I was teaching five to seven studies a week, preparing for each of those studies to, to be ready to share the Word of God. And you do that for a while, four decades, and I hope by now I'm not sitting there going, oh, I lost my place. Oh, 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 my God. <laughs> no. I can pop a wheelie and ride and still teach and have Theo run around. And, you know, people are like, how do you teach with a kid going back and forth? Like, oh, I don't, you know. <laughs> You just get you get to where it's like no hands. For the Italian, that's an you, you just just go. I'm just gonna praise the Lord and keep on going. But see, I'm only using that example because some of you have gifts and you have done like my daughter did, parked your bike on the side of the house and never use it. And you don't know what it feels like to get to that sweet spot of using your gift. You need to exercise. Paul wrote to the to the Church of Ephesus. Exercise the gift, that spiritual gift, what is given to you. If your gift is exhortation, that means encouraging someone to do that which is right. In, not in man's sight, in God's sight. You see, you say, you, you know, some, some people come along, they're just like, hey, you got to just do what, you know, what, what's the Lord showing you to do? There's certain people that are so gifted with the gift of exhortation. There was a guy named Charlie Foster in our fellowship in Arizona, and Charlie what an anointed exhorter that guy would come along and someone be struggling and they'd be going through a trial and he'd be like hey man hang in there it's gonna be okay what, what do you think the lord's telling you to do and they'd be like well i know i should trust the lord in this and i know i should do this and i i should forgive and let him and he'd be like good that's what you should do he never said it in a condemning way though he had a way of somehow always wording it to where it's like you wanted to do what was good after you talked to charlie you, you wanted to go use your gift. You wanted to serve the Lord. Because you had that special gift of... Maybe you're an exhorter. Maybe you're an encourager. Did you know that's a gift of the Holy Ghost? To come along and just lift up somebody. When somebody is down, you might be that person that just gives them that hand up. And that might be your gift. And some people see you come, they're like, Boy, am I glad they're coming. They always seem to pick me up. I remember every time I see Charlie come, I'd be like, Yes! doesn't matter how bad the day is. Charlie's going to come up with some corny joke that makes me want to serve the Lord. You know, or he's going to have some way of putting it, you know, that just, or some word that just, he just had that gift. Now those people are near and dear. They don't get featured much up front in the church spotlight, you know, from the pulpit. But let me tell you as a pastor how important they are to the whole congregation behind the scenes. Now if that's your gift, all means you better use it if your gift is administration then you better use it whatever your gift alfred uses his gift every day comes and serves and cleans and helps me keep my house in order outside and rakes and sweeps and picks up all the oh man just try to raise a family and keep a house together when it's an old house that's falling apart and you, you i need a i need a whole crew and this week i've the last three weeks i had barnabas helping me just sand and paint and fix all the damage. I mean, old wood house, what do you want? You got to fix stuff, you know? What a blessing that man's been. Now, Barnabas in Hebrew, bar Nabus, bar means son of, and Nabus means encouragement. So, what a good name, son of encouragement. Amen. Who's been helping you? Huh, son of encouragement. <laughs> Pretty good deal to have a son of encouragement helping you. Now, whatever that gift is that you have, I want to encourage you. You know, if Barnabas is saying, I did a study once and there's like 14 spiritual gifts that I could find. And I'm like, yeah. There's some in Romans and in Corinthians and all these different gifts. I said, yeah, that's good. That's good. And Ephesians. And I said, yeah. I said, do you know what your gift is? Because when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, make sure that the gift what you have that was given to you by the laying on of hands, that gift of, he was an evangelist, by the way, Timothy. Make sure that that gift you have, that you use it. So whatever your gift is, if you don't use it, you don't get fulfilled spiritually. You just kind of stagnate. You don't really get to enjoy what God has for you. And this is my last study to give 
with my son-in-law here, Robbie, is uh, Thursday leaving for Texas mm -hmm. to go look to buy a house. So as we, I need to give a good study that uh, he'll remember to stick with him to keep using his gift as he goes out there. And, and it's, a, it's hard for me because I'm like, this is means. And then Joy is going to follow him a few days later. I get Joy and, and, and Theo for one more Sunday. That's it. And Abby. Oh. And Abby. Yeah, next week you guys will hear Abby Woo! in the background like <laughs> a coon hound. <laughs> but I got to tell you that, you know, it's uh, it, it whenever you are teaching with, like I do, I, I just pray, Lord, give me the right word at the right time for the people that need it. Because in the Proverbs it says uh, that right word given at just the right time. Have you ever had said that someone say to you the, the exact thing you needed to hear? Mm -hmm. Right when you needed to hear it. Mm -hmm. How precious is that? Proverbs says it's like an apple of gold. Golden <coughs> apple in a setting of silver. <laughs> you just gave them such a... I mean, can you imagine a, whole, a solid gold apple? Daniel, how much would that be worth? <laughs> Daniel got a little teeny pendant from his bride for... For his um, wedding gift, for his chain, it's a little lion head, and 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 and, 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 and you know it's th like this big, and it's like this wide, and it's it's thin, you know, it's like a narrow, and it's pricey, in today's gold prices. But can you imagine a whole golden apple? Here, here's an apple of gold, and I say, how much would that thing worth? I mean, we're talking pounds of gold, you know. That would be, well, that's how precious it is. Precious it is when you get to hear the right sermon on the right day. Amen. You're like, man, that preacher, I just needed to hear that. That was, you know, such a good word. Really, my soul needed to hear that. That's that's how precious the right thing is at the right time. That's what I want to send Robbie off with. Now, the last song on the song sheet I put on there just for Joy and Rob because it's a song that it, it comes from Romans chapter 14. It says, the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. It's not a bunch of rules. It's about three gauges. I call it the three gauges for your spiritual life. About righteousness, peace, and what's the last one? Joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. What's right in the Holy Ghost? Righteousness. What's right with God? Right in right standing with God. What gives you peace? The peace of God, not the peace of the world, because they're different things. Peace of the world means absence of conflict. Peace of God is His assurance through the conflict. It's just like the psalmist said, he's watching over me no matter what I'm going through. I got peace, the peace of God. And the last thing is the joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost. And when you're doing what's right, God causes your joy to abound even when your circumstances can be crumbs. This is really important to remember. Joy is not based on a situation. It's not, situ it's not happiness, even though it has some of the same manifestations. Joy and happiness are different. Happiness is based on circumstances being just right. Joy is based on your relationship with God being just right. If you're in sin, your joy meter will go down. I, I can tell you this. David cried it out in Psalm 51. He said, Create in me, O God, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And then the last thing he said was, Restore unto me what? The joy, the joy of thy salvation. The joy of thy salvation. Why did he say that? What he had just done? He just slept with Bathsheba. He had had Bathsheba's husband killed. Pushed to the front of David had sinned. The prophet had busted him on his sin. And David realized, my joy is gone. See, when you sin, and by the way, I can always, some of you are like, Pastor, how did you know I was in sin? I'm like, um, your joy meter was pegging the minus. Not, not even at zero, it's below zero. You had no joy at all. Joyless Christians are a dead giveaway. There's something going wrong. But if you don't make it about a bunch of rules, and I know my son-in-law's been a great spiritual leader for my, my daughter, Joy, because it's not about a bunch of rules from the Bible. It's about being right with God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. And they're going to face big decisions like where do they go next, you know, in Texas? What house do they get? And I'm praying the Lord, well, Daniel and, and, and Rob went out there to spy it out. And they looked at places. They said, Dad, on paper, this one on Zillow looked perfect. And then we got there and 
You know, it's like the place was perfect, but wasn't in the perfect place. It was like all the surrounding area was junk. And, you know, if they could have just picked up that farm and moved it over to a different location, then it would have been perfect. You know, and I was like, well, then it wasn't the right one. And they're like, yeah, we just didn't have peace about it. I said, I'm glad you're paying attention to those gauges. You know, I, I sent them out when they got ready to go. Guys, remember these three things, righteousness, peace, and joy. When you stand on that property, you say, Lord, is this the right one? Do I have peace about this? Do I have joy about this? And when you have all three of those gauges reading correctly, it's funny how everything just clicks and goes together. It makes it so much, even if the ride is bumpy and it's not easy, when you know it's the right thing and you have the peace and you have the joy, it all works out. And so they're gonna be leaving this week. Uh, Rob's gonna be flying out Thursday to Phoenix, pick up Michelle, my daughter that's out there with all her stuff, buy a truck and drive all the way to Texas and look for a place. So keep them in your prayers this week. Uh, we, we, we really covet your prayers for them that they would guide and direct them. And then Joy will follow with Theo and Abby a few days later and hopefully he'll have already found a place. Oh, Go Rob. <laughs> Go Rob. No pressure. No, that's a big prayer request. You know, they have a place it, to it, land. It, it, yeah, they have a place to land. They get to go see Dave and Jill and the Bowmans that used to be here with us. And uh, so we're really grateful for that family. Love you guys if you're watching. And um, and so, you know, we look forward to seeing what will God do? You know, as so the Lord's directing their steps. It's exciting times. Daniel and Lena are married. They're kind of praying about going and following. So uh, all of a sudden, you know, and, and Raquel, by the way, is getting married next month. September 17th so um, so isn't Jan are gonna have all their kids married and it's gonna be weird and and off you know like a, 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 I don't know what's gonna happen next so. Mm, yes. so I need some prayers too you know that's okay to ask even as a pastor to show humility and say you know what even even when I'm trying to teach you seek the Lord when you don't know because if you ask it says yeah. ask and you shall what receive. receive seek and ye shall what find knock and the door will be open. May that be the, the encouragement. Now, I didn't say those words. Who said those words in the Bible? Jesus. Jesus. May Jesus' words comfort you as you seek and you knock and, and you ask. And may you receive whatever he has for you. May the Holy Spirit give you what you need this week as you go on. And don't forget Psalm 121. This one they sang as they ascended to Jerusalem. Lord, you keep watch over us now and forever on. Now and forever on, He will watch over you. Well, blessings from Kona, Hawaii. We'll see you next week. I'm going to continue our study, I think, in these Psalms. I have another one that I really like coming up. Uh, and I'll put it on the church website, uh, on the Facebook, so you know which one to read for next week. Um, but it's, uh, you know, there's it, there's a couple of the really short ones. I might put two or three together next week for you in the in the same book, Book 5 of the Psalms. So, if you're wondering where I'm getting this, all from the last book of the Psalms. And um, they're really encouraging Psalms. They got really simple messages that sometimes I think Christians forget. Even old ones. You know, with, not us. But not me and Connie. <laughs> <laughs> she laughs with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, blessings from Kona, Hawaii. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may he give you his peace. So blessings. Aloha.